put the place up. Welcome to Your Next Chapter, the podcast diving into the transformative impact of storytelling on innovation. I'm Jeremiah Tittle, CEO of Next Chapter Podcast, your host for conversations with creative minds reshaping their worlds through narrative. We have a special crossover episode with Riding Tandem with Vivian Kavam, a podcast full of inspiration, education, and tips for business owners and nonprofit leaders to design the life they want. Both Vivian and I work with similar organizations, but support them in slightly different ways. Uh, I hope you feel just as inspired and fulfilled with this conversation as I did. Enjoy the show. Hi, Vivian. Welcome to your next chapter. And of course, we're also on Riding Tandem. Hi. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. Welcome everyone to a crossover episode, which is really fun. These are like some of my favorite things to do. So thanks for being here. And yeah, so I'm the host of Riding Tandem. And of course, you're the host of your next chapter. And I thought it might be fun. Why don't you start first? You you fill in what is your next chapter and what that all looks like. Well, absolutely. Happy to share more about the uh, genesis of uh, your next chapter was, you know, when you make podcasts for other people and have done so for years and years and years, uh, there's always this, I don't know if I'd call it a chicken or the egg or what kind of conundrum there is in, in figuring out what you want to talk about, what I wanted to talk <laughs> about on this podcast. Now, part of it is demonstrating to, you know, potential clients, like the type of business that we we run here you know we care we want to have a positive impact in the stories that we tell and i thought what other what better way uh working with our talented executive producer nick kastner um what would be a better way uh to get that message across but also to meet folks that are doing cool creative uh, shows themselves uh, such as you vivian and uh so a little networking a little demonstrating of you know what we do and then getting deep with folks on on why they tell stories, why st storytelling is so important mm -hmm. and and how that is kind of integrating integrated with what they do. And and the your next chapter title, obviously the name of our company is Next Chapter Podcast, but I always like hearing when people made a pivot either historically in their career or um, moving forward like what's on the forefront, what's on the horizon and and so that's always kind of my favorite question at the end of every interview is what's your next chapter? What do you, what are you looking at next? And we don't have to get there yet, <laughs> but, but that's kind of where all this came together. Um, would you mind telling me a little bit more about riding tandem? Yeah. Uh, I would love to know about your show's concept originally and you could bring it into the world. Well, first I have to say like co-sign the whole, it's really fun to hear how people have like these pivotal changes because we all go through those, right? But it's fun to hear the stories from other people. And that's a big piece of writing tandem. So we put together writing tandem, my business partner, Michaela and I put together writing tandem as a way for business owners, people thinking about starting a business and just leaders within organizations to be able to tell those stories. It's really a look behind the scenes. It's the real life stories where I think people have a lot of curiosity about what is it like to run a business? What does that, you know, like, what does that entail? Cause you see, you see like maybe a glamorized version of it, especially cause there's been like shark tank and just different shows out there. So like, what does it really look like? What are the behind the scenes stories? And then for people who are even in it already, the business owner themselves, I think they sometimes can get stuck in a bubble. I know I have as a business owner, where we don't share our stories with each other, whether we're protecting, you know, something we're like, oh gosh, we don't want somebody to know that that's what's really happening or we're just busy and things are going on. So this writing tandem is a place to be able to share those stories, have encouragement, and then also just to pick up some great like tidbits along the way too. So sometimes we have experts on as well who can just help bring like a new fresh idea, maybe inspire someone in a different way, but definitely very story driven because I feel like that's where we learn right? I mean, gosh, that's how you're like, how your business is shaped is around this idea that when we're sharing stories, I feel like we learn a lot. Don't you think? A hundred percent. You know, there's nothing like someone else's, you know, personal story of whether they're feeling stuck and deciding to start a business or feeling stuck in their business and, and looking for kind of that new pathway to, to how do we redefine? Cause it's a constant evolution 
I think that is happening. I, I don't know a lot of people who become an entrepreneur and then just kind of stick to no. their guns on, on what got them in it in the first place. And, and you know, that's that means you're going to churn out and, and maybe the business won't succeed unless you're really open to evolution. Yeah. So with that in mind, too, I'm just curious, like, you know, you gave a little history of where you're at right now, but what's like your your backstory? Like, bring me through your backstory a little bit. How did you end up here with this this whole idea and concept? I grew up in Washington, D.C., um, spent the majority of my life there working for different radio companies. I started with iHeart locally and then um, worked for Sirius XM Radio for about a decade. And I like to say that's when I learned how to make podcasts before podcasts were a thing. Right. I was producing a lot of weekly shows with some famous people from different walks of life. And, um, and, and I remember distinctly the tail end of that time when Apple Podcasts was just getting started, iTunes. And we would put our shows on iTunes. And I thought to myself, I was like, who's going to listen to this? <laughs> I mean, this is, I mean, I guess it's a, it was a nice way to give away something for free on that platform. Um, but yeah, I always thumb my nose at the podcasting world until I joined a company, TuneIn Internet Radio in San Francisco. And it's a proper tech company, but internet radio. And I produced, launched you know, a handful of podcasts there in the three years that I was there. But I did notice that the podcast industry was taking off. Um, and I thought to myself, the, I'm kind of the hamstrung in a way at TuneIn to be able to be more nimble. I felt as a podcast producer with all this background in radio that I could uh, apply a lot of what I've learned and, and be more nimble yeah. of starting my own company at Next Chapter. So that's where I saw the opportunity. And then so fortunate, you know, the timing um, of our first original podcast, The 500, we got to deal with Spotify. And then um, we produce a News for Kids show with my partner uh, in the kids department, Tracy Kaplan. Yes. Um, this News for Kids show, The 10 News, we got to deal with iHeart for that. Um, and since then, it's been, you know, producing podcasts for for clients and and uh, and for nonprofits mostly that really want to want to tell stories and and for us to be able to facilitate that has been such a pleasure over the the last six years amazing that's awesome <laughs> yeah the kids news program when we first met I was like hold up I have listened to that um, and it's great like it's such an excellent way for kids to just kind of be in the know I remember listening to it. And I don't even know why I don't remember. I was not a child when I was listening to it, but, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just love that. It was such a great, just such a, it's such a great way for kids to be able to like be in touch with things in a great positive way too. So yeah. So it was kind of this like fun moment. Where I was like, wait, you're the people behind the, like behind the scenes with that. That's so awesome. Oh, very sweet. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, the majority of the praise needs to go to Tracy because she's, kind of day to day producing, uh, that executive producing and, and the creator of the show. Um, and I think like you, you get in these situations where it's like, how do we talk about this really touchy subject, yeah. but do it in a way that kids can understand. Mm -hmm. It doesn't scare them necessarily, but it's also not it, really, it's supposed to be a conversation starter for parents and kids about, um, Gaza, for example, like, how do you do that for a eight to 12 year old. Exactly. Not, not a simple task. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I think that's one of the interesting things we're talking about, just talking about the storytelling piece and the value that it does provide and how it can, it can impact so many different levels, right? Like from kids to employees, to volunteers, board members, CEOs, like storytelling really touches everyone. And that's the thing that I love about it is that we can all connect, but it is about bringing the right story to the right people, you know, in the right format. And I think that's such a great example of that. Just like such a tangible example. I also, okay. So this makes so yeah. much more sense. The radio voice. Is this why you have the radio voice? <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. And I'm still on the radio. I, during the pandemic, I moved to Maui um, three and a half years ago. And, you know, my whole business went online. Uh, so it was like, why am I still paying these crazy rents in San Francisco? And 
and all that. So I know I wasn't the only one. A lot of people moved to Austin, Texas from California. Right. And, you know, there was quite a migration maybe out of the cities. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I'm living in small town Maui. There's not much going on here, but I have reconnected with my love of radio where I started my uh, career and have uh, been DJing uh, on a couple of the local radio stations here, which is you know, just back to my first love. Right. It's been really lovely, actually. That's awesome. <laughs> Doing that. So I am curious then, because yeah. your background was in, you know, so much in radio and then starting your own business. What were some of the things that you found you loved and what were some of the things that you found maybe more of a challenge sort of moving into that space? Well, one thing I'll say, candidly, not the most organized person. I'm much more on the creative side. So as a CEO, that means that um, like the accounting and right. kind of the, the harder things that like setting up LLCs, like, you know, I was able to, to, to do those things, uh, given the tools available, legal zoom. Thank you. Right. Um, but <laughs> you know, uh, we since have, you know, a lawyer and, and other folks that are helping the business kind of stay on track with the IRS, et cetera. We have a great accountant, all that, but um, the story I was going to tell you is that we had a COO up until late last year. And when he left uh, to go back into the corporate world and leaving this little startup here, uh, I became the COO as well. <laughs> and I will not say it's a, a passion for me. Uh, it's definitely, um, you know, making sure people get paid on time. We just got through the first tax season without the COO. And that was my biggest trepidation and concern. Um, I think we got through it unscathed, but, um, <laughs> they will let you know, like I said, not my passion, but yeah, but it's definitely been a challenge and, 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 uh, an exciting one, uh, maybe, maybe less excitement, but more, you know, like trying out muscles that aren't, you know, super strong and, and, and kind of getting, uh, checking the boxes and dotting the I's and crossing the T's hopefully, uh, against my kind of natural inclination, you know? Yeah. It is interesting to wiggle into spaces that don't feel particularly comfortable. And when you're running a business or a nonprofit too, I know like we both have a lot of crossover with for-profit and nonprofit, and we do quite a bit of our work actually is with nonprofits as well. But in both, like you're often stretched and asked to wiggle into spaces that aren't necessarily like your wheelhouse or your first love. And we actually hear at tandem works even we're a small company but we still have we call it an accountability chart that we keep on the wall and so i just have to say real quick mm -hmm. we also fill seats that are not our like bet we're not best suited for but there isn't someone else to fill it so we actually have a little hazard symbol <laughs> next to those seats on our <laughs> wall chart just as a reminder like to ourselves to give grace but then also to each other of like hey you know vivian's filling this seat and it's not really her wheelhouse so she's doing the best she can um but there is a hazard symbol there just as a reminder of like this isn't like <laughs> i'm a little bit of a hazard here so um so that's been helpful for us and Again, I mean, it's like, I, we're going to talk storytelling all the time, but like, that's the, like, it's the internal story. Like we need to remember our own narratives, right? Like within our organizations and even with ourselves, if we've got to give some grace and then look for the right people, <laughs> we're, we're always like ready for the right people. This so resonates with me. And, uh, I love, I love that you're, you're sharing the importance of communication internally, obviously with, with your organization, but also about, um, you know, giving yourself grace and self-love. I know this might be getting off track in terms of what, you know, hardcore business talk, but I will say like the importance of, you know, when you're learning a new thing or you're filling a role that's, you know, I barely made it through accounting in uh, my master's program. I, I went to American University for business school and uh, dropped out after, uh, yeah, a third of the way through of getting my um, MBA. Uh, so I'm a, a business school dropout. Uh, I'll tell you that. But the, the accounting classes, I mean, I had three I had to take and the first one was very difficult, uh, just made it through. But, um, you know, I, I got a, a great job down in Miami working in TV. And I was like, well, what's the point of business school? Right. It's to either start your own business, which I ultimately ended up doing, or <laughs> finding like a dream job, which I ended up getting and leaving. Um, 
But all that is to say is that, um, you know, growing up, um, you know, in DC, you know, I, I have had a tendency to be really hard on myself and to be a perfectionist and all that. And, and what that doesn't really make room for is the delegation and the realizing you may not be the strongest, Mm -hmm. uh, at a certain aspect of your business, but rather than being hard on yourself and feeling really bad about it, feeling guilty, you know, really acknowledging kind of publicly or, or privately within your organization, like, Hey, that hazard sign is there for a reason. And one day we'll find a person who's really good at this, but maybe for now, you know, I just need that grace. I, I think that's a beautiful thing. And I've had to, that's been what the last three plus years has been for me is all, you know, self love and, and how do I go easy on myself when that doesn't come naturally to me? Do you have any oh, similarities there? Or yes. Experience I mean the that? same. So I, um, I'm definitely a like white knuckler, I would call it. Like I'm the type where I'll just white knuckle my way through things. And some of that's just, um, you know, upbringing and like great parents, awesome, up, awesome upbringing. But there was a little more of like, hey, we're just going to push through this. And um, so, yeah, I definitely do that. And I was laughing with my yoga instructor, actually. I made a commitment this year to go twice a week, which was like a kind of a big deal for me. I went once a week and sometimes missed, sure. but I was like, I'm doing twice a week. It cuts into the workday a little, but I was kind of chuckling with her because she often will say things during class about, you know, grab a prop if you need or a blanket, like, and she says to be kind to yourself. And, and I had just for probably two years would go, I don't need a blanket. I don't need a prop. Like, you know, I'm, she- I'm strong enough for this or that. And this whole idea of like being kind to yourself just was not seeping into my brain. And then one day I was like, gosh, dang it. I want a blanket. And I used a blanket. And it was like, this sounds, as I say it, I'm like, it seems so small. And yet in my brain, it like cracked open this whole area that's really impacted all areas of my life and in business um, and personal life both, which are really quite intertwined for me um, of just this repeating myself like, okay, you need to be kind to yourself and to others. It's not just about being kind to others. Like you've got to be kind to yourself. So yeah, I, and that has not mm-hmm. come naturally for me at all. Um, just very much a like, you know, kind of no pain, no gain type of mentality. And yeah. I do think there are times that you do push through and you need to have the tenacity. But I think I was like 99.9% tenacity and <laughs> half of a percent of, you know, kindness to myself. So yeah, it's been, um, it's been a journey. And again, it's like those stories that we tell ourselves, right. And then that seeps mm. into our culture. I know one of the things we wanted to talk about was just like telling our own story and what storytelling, like what's the value that it provides to organizations. And I know we'll probably talk about yeah. sort of the external storytelling part because that's, you know, where a lot of people are, but I just want to say like the internal storytelling that happens within an organization, I think is where some of the highest value is businesses and, and nonprofit organizations often get stuck in, I don't know how to tell my story. I don't know how to tell my story. I don't know which story to tell. Um, and it's usually outwardly right to hire or to bring in a new client or to recruit, et cetera, maybe bring in donor dollars. And a lot of times what we end up talking with organizations about is, well, what are the stories we're telling internally first, both to ourselves as Mm. the board or the CEO or, you know, as a team, what are we saying to ourselves? What are we saying to each other? Because that story will naturally start to ripple outside of your walls. And there's certainly mechanics that can be put in place, you know, whether you opt for a podcast or you're going to do print and things like that. But so much of the value, I think, starts within the organization itself, and then that story perpetuates itself outward. So we've we've come up against that a couple times. I, I don't mean against it necessarily in like a negative way, but where that's like a big yeah. awakening idea of like, oh, we've been so focused on our social media or something like that, but we're not even 100% sure what our story is to each other right now. One thing that we um, were in the process, just a quick anecdote of um, launching a new website. Mm-hmm. And we were on this old version of Squarespace. Our web developer was like, you have to get off this because <laughs> on mobile, it doesn't look yeah. like 
looks bad. Um, it's like, okay, we need to upgrade. We're going to create a new website. And so what we did in that process was had a, um, a brand audit right. we did with uh, um, a staff member, Brian Douglas, who, who did such a good job of like, all right, let's open up. We may not be in the same place to do like proper whiteboarding necessarily. We're spread out across the country, but we uh, we can do like kind of a digital virtual whiteboarding of like, all right, let's look at our mission. Let's look at our, um, you know, what are we putting out into the world now? And who do we, who are we and who do we want to be? Yeah. That work was so valuable um, for us to look at our mission statement, maybe tweak it, um, maybe think about, you know, how are we going to present the world with this new website caused us to go in, inside, right. caused us to really between my business partner, Michael and myself and, and, and with Brian and, and with some others looking at it and, and to get a greater understand of who we are and who we want to be was that first step. Mm -hmm. So that your story really speaks to me. And I think it applies to anyone who might hire us or want to work with us to take that time, even if it feels like, no, let's just get to it. Yes. Let's make the podcast. Let's <laughs> um, let's, what's the concept, you know, that we're going to pursue, et cetera. And, and really, I think you're skipping a step that's really important. Right. When somebody uh, comes to an organization, comes to you and says, we're thinking about a podcast, where do you start them off? Do they tend to present like, we just have the idea, we kind of baked, it's already fully baked, or are they coming to you saying, we just like this podcast idea? Where do we start? Like, what stage are they at? We have clients from all different stages of readiness. Mm -hmm. um, some... They have the, the talent in place. It's the CEO of their organization and they, you know, talk the talk so they're ready to go. And it's just a matter of them, you know, interviewing uh, folks about an issue that's really important to their business. Um, and then other times you have, uh, we're walking in the door with pretty much nothing and, uh, and it took us months to name the show right. and <laughs> finding the talent to you know, a lot of time because, you know, you want someone else hosting it. Like recent example was with the museum uh, based in North Carolina uh, called the Levine Museum of the New South. So they're a history museum with a social justice um, angle, uh, which is very much aligned with, you know, the type of content we want to be creating. So the good thing is they have history and history does well in podcasting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people want to learn and have good takeaways. And, and so, okay, you're starting off with some good, um, material there, but who's going to be the one talking? Um, how are we going to craft each episode? Is it going to be, you know, that you have this more simple, we're doing an interview podcast now. So that's a little bit more simple than if you're adding in kind of a historical context of a, a teaser at the beginning of the episode, and maybe you have multiple interviews like we did for this series, as opposed to, uh, like this is just one interview and we're going to put this episode out. So yeah, the structure of it and, and how complicated that is, um, you know, getting a good team uh, with a, a strong producer with experience and then a great sound designer and editors. And yeah, I, I like to say we build teams around people. Uh, even if that the, the people behind it, they might know they want a podcast, but um how do they want it to sound? You know, it's, it's, it's really a collaborative effort. What's, what's your experience? Do, do you have fully baked uh, most of the time? Do you have some that say, Hey, I get the podcasting is valuable, but I don't know where to start. And you kind of pick up there. Yeah. So that's a great question. A lot of times podcasts generally with us come up during our we have kind of a signature offering. We do a lot of customized work, which it sounds like you do as well. Like you're kind of picking and pulling and choosing yeah. what makes sense. But we do have a couple of signature offers and one is our communication and roadmap sessions. And so that's where a lot of people would think of it as like a marketing plan. We steer away from saying marketing plan just because sometimes that comes with the connotation of a checkbox. We checked a box and now the marketing plan sits on a shelf somewhere or collects a digital desk, as Michaela says, in some folder. Mm -hmm. So um, we use roadmap language because it really is like checklist roadmaps, you know, simple goals, things we can get to. So during those sessions is usually when podcasting comes up 
because it is a great tool for telling a story. It's a great tool for building awareness. Um, it can also be a really great culture building tool for an organization as well. And um, yeah. I don't know if you've run into this at all, but like there are actually companies out there that use podcasts almost internally where they're using it like a, you know, an audio um, experience for large internal teams. So there's a lot of like avenues you can take. I mean, you can go crime scene podcasts, right? Like some people are always like, oh man, those are so cool. But within the organizations and that that we work with, crime scene, crime podcasts don't come up too often, which is kind of a bummer. I'm um, sure. Yes. My husband would be like, <laughs> oh my gosh. It's like all we listen to when we're driving to national parks. So um, I have to turn them <laughs> off at some point. I'm like, I can't listen to another murder. Like I need something a little lighter, we need a little 99% invisible or something right now. Um, but yeah, that's Love that's it. when it really comes up is like, is this a good tool for us to use? Are we ready for it? And then can does the organization have the ability to connect with, um, with someone like you, right? With an organization like yours who then can help take it to the next level. So when it comes to the podcast piece, we're usually helping more with some of the pre-work of here's what some concepts might be, here's what the formatting could look like. So we're kind of giving them the tools to start with that. Naming, I, people get so stuck on names, right? And like on the one hand, oh, like, yeah. yeah, it is so important. And on the flip side, there are times where we tell clients like, you need to pick one and move on. <laughs> it's okay. Like you can grow <laughs> with this. Um, you know, you've got some really good options here because uh, I feel like you can get so stuck on names, logos, colors, and fonts with anything so within cool. organizations, businesses, storytelling. We're like, end of the day, like those are enhancements to the story um, and they are important. So I'm not going to downplay it, but we can get really stuck there because we can see it and it's tangible. Like what's the cover artwork going to look like? And you know, what's the ching -a ring sound going to be as it comes in or with, with our clients sometimes too, they're doing print and video. And so it's lots of different aspects that we're helping guide them to a vendor. But that's one of the big things is like, let's massage the concept and then let's keep moving. Cause you can always iterate like some of the biggest brands in the world have changed their logos and have switched colors and have even changed names. So like, oh, yeah. like you're going to be okay. You know, is sometimes the conversation we're having, like, hold our hand, we're picking now let's keep moving. <laughs> I love that. No, so many, so much of what you just said resonated with me and on the internal podcast, we produced early on, um, a private podcast for Moet Hennessy USA. Okay. They only had 400 staff members yeah. or employees, um, but uh, they wanted to kind of share their DEI initiatives and and talk more about what resources yeah. uh, they had for their employees that I felt like was such a good idea. Yeah. You know, it, it wasn't the most expensive production, but it was, I think, impactful to provide. I, I just believe people learn differently. You know, a lot of people are visual. Um, yes. Some people... Our readers. Um, and then there's a subset of us psychologically, I say us, you know, humans, <laughs> uh, that listening is, is the best way to really permeate or, or, or get through, um, to folks, you know, that, that you just have that isolation of focus, you get your earbuds in, maybe you're uh, putting an Ikea a desk together or whatever <laughs> it is while you're listening to a great podcast. Um, but I just, I feel like that's, that's, it's powerful. And it's, it's why, you know, in building podcasts, you know, it's, it's, it, it's just a lot of people um, that really works for people. Um, and so I'm wondering, it's really helpful to hear kind of how you structure it in, in supporting clients and vendors. I was just wondering how much emphasis do you put on the, the storytelling aspect of mm -hmm. it? Like, um, you know, some organizations might struggle to articulate their mission in a way that resonates with their audience. Um, you know, what does that process look like for you? Yeah. So as far as helping people like craft that, so mission, vision, value, purpose statements, core values, they can start to kind of like swirl together. Right. Um, and they are all pieces of your story and important pieces but they also, again, can be places that we can get stuck. And then I, we start using fluffy words. 
And so one of the things that we do help our clients with is to kind of peel back the layers and say, forget the external for now. We're working internally, you know, we're as a team, everything that we're saying stays here. We just, we got to work the wiggles out a little. And so hmm. we often start with the basic basics of your value proposition, right? What do you do? Who do you do it for? And how do you diff differentiate from everyone else? Or how do you do it in a unique way from everyone else? And so it's literally a fill in the blank exercise that we do. It's one sentence and, you know, it can feel too simple. But a lot of times we find that both businesses and nonprofits have a really hard time articulating that into one sentence. Mm -hmm. And we don't necessarily think that you have to like, you know, that that's your elevator pitch or anything like that. But it's like the basic framework. We need to be able to say that first. And then we can embellish the story with, you know, who are the heroes? And, you know, if you kind of follow the, the storytelling um, frameworks like that, but we start there first and then we do start talking about, okay, here's the, who we do it for. Let's, let's take that a little further. Usually we need to expand that a little bit beyond, you know, one or two words, the way we're unique. We start to expand that because, you know, there's multiple unique ways what you do, you know, there might be some caveats to that, some nuances, but we always start there first and then we start picking and pulling throughout the rest of it. And then from there, we usually focus next on core values next um, because that helps guide how you're going to tell your stories. You want to be sure that they're tying back to core values. And, um, you know, one of the big conversations we have is not every core value is your core value. Um, there are a lot of great core <laughs> values out there and you can't have them all. So we have to like refine <laughs> down, right? You can appreciate like a whole bunch of core values, but your organization needs to get it synthesized down. Um, and that can be hard sometimes, especially when you have teams because you're bringing multiple people's core values together. But then the third step, and yeah. I'm kind of oversimplifying the process for this example, but the third step that we do is we really focus in on you have to know and own your story and what's unique about it. So we work through, we have worksheets and we have whiteboarding. There's all kinds of exercises we do, but end of the day, we answer some questions for everyone. But one of the biggest questions, especially with our nonprofit clients, for profits too, though, is why are you here? Like you personally. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very different for people. And there's nothing wrong with saying, well, I'm here because there's great benefits. I like the flexible schedule. It aligns with things I value, et cetera, et cetera. For someone else, they may have a very personal story that's like, you know, a gut wrenching story about why they're here with a family member, et cetera. Both of those stories are valuable and they both bring um, important pieces to the table. So we workshop through those. And then the last piece is really working on do you understand your audience's story? Because the end of the day, your story is important, but if we can't figure out how to connect it with your audience, who, by the way, is standing in the grocery store line scrolling or reading or consuming while being distracted by a toddler who wants the candy bar, while you know, all these things, we got to be sure that we're really <laughs> connecting with their story. So, and I think that's true of the podcast, right? Like, are you capturing them in the, you know, in the hubbub of the day? Are they going to take the time to flip that podcast on while they're on the treadmill or driving or picking kids up in the school line, whatever it is, you know, for them putting together an Ikea table. Great example. I can't do that. I cannot listen to something and put together an Ikea table. I'm just going to say that right now. <laughs> that is not a skill I have. <laughs> I, I often use that example because I was listening to uh, the startup, which actually inspired me to start this startup yeah, with Next Chapter. Yeah. Um, and I was literally putting together IKEA furniture when I was listening to it. <laughs> and I just talented. could not stop listening. <laughs> yeah. So I use that example all the time because it was inspiring to me. And I thought, oh, we can inspire other people. We can make great podcasts that, you know, tell great stories and, and, uh, and, and just to kind of hammer home your point about kind of connecting your mission with your clients, you know, kind of experience of, um, of working with us. I was wondering, would you share some examples of some nonprofit organizations or just in general clients that uh, have excelled in their storytelling thanks to your support? 
one that comes to mind is the local um, chapter of Habitat for Humanity in our area. They did a full roadmap strategy session with us, really just trying to outline and hammer in on like what what are the stories we want to tell? How are we connecting all these things? And as well as just internal and external communications, both. And gosh, it has been so fun to see them. You know, I think a big piece of it is we know, we intuitively know our stories. And sometimes we intuitively know our audience stories. I think that's where there's a lot of disconnect a lot of the time is that we think that everyone sees us the way we see us, right? Um, but the feedback can be different. But I think one of the really neat things to see is just them step out with a next level of confidence. They're already a great organization. They're already doing great things. They were telling their story, but to see them go, okay, we have like a map, we have a checklist, the whole team feels aligned here now. And it's been really fun because we stay in touch with our clients once they go through that experience with us. And I love that they reach out, like they reach out and you can tell they're like, they're working through it. They're experimenting, they're trying things and they're, they're problem solving as they go with this framework along with them. So that's been really neat. Um, another one we worked with is new visions, homeless services, homeless shelter and services here local for us again with that one. And I think again, like it was just bringing, you know, we brought boots on the ground, the people who are out doing work on the streets, um, with our homeless neighbors and, and the people who are on the board, you know, who maybe are not boots on the street, it brought them all together and to see the pride, right? Like just the pride in their work to see that the accomplishments they have, they have made, but then to hear their big hairy goals was probably one of the coolest things, um, to understand and know, and to have the whole team hear that, and then just be thinking about what that can look like as like a, it could just change the whole community. That's really neat. And that's the power there, right? Of we've said the story, but did everyone hear the story? Um, did we take time to really look at it and own it? And then the last one I'll share would be with, there's a foundation here called Iowa West Foundation, and they help steward monies back into the local community through grants. So they, they provide grants out and they did a really neat thing. They hired us in for, to help with something called imagine hours. And with that one, the storytelling ripple effect there has been really cool and something I'm really proud of being part of because it was gathering feedback from the community, but it also was this storytelling happening within these sessions. We did, I want to say it was like 11 of them over a number of months. And it was an invite to the entire community, all ages to see people come and share ideas, which of course spark stories. And then to walk out writing new stories was really awesome. And just the perception of sometimes this community, I think has been painted at council bluffs is the community I'm in right now. They have so much going for them, but sometimes I think we forget it, right? Again, we're so close to our own stories. So it's just been neat to see how they've taken that and they are rippling that out. They've been doing a great job with um, just being sure that people are aware because that was a big learning was people are very connected to the stories here, but they're not necessarily remembering to tell them. Those aren't the stories that they're remembering to tell. So they've been doing a great job of now telling those and making sure that they are out front and center. I mean, I'm so glad Nick put us together to have this conversation because um, because one thing, if you look at our content, you look at all our podcasts, we do so many different things. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we're here to entertain folks, but really we have a, a, a strong passion for making the world a better place. And, you know, and that, that can come in small and in, in large impact doses. But I, um, but I can tell based on, you know, the client list, you just, you know, uh, uh, listed off that the uh, um, that you have a passion for for making the world a better place, and these types of organizations are coming to you. Um, so I just want to say, you know, bravo because um, I don't know. That's where my heart's mm -hmm. at. I mean, I was raised by two pastors, so I, um, I I often like come back to this as like, what's my why? Yeah. You know, it's to to educate people, but really like how to the, how does the storytelling that we 
support through our organizations, you know, allow us to sleep better at night and, you know, and, and feel like we're a part of the solution right. and, and doing good to get the word out about these organizations and, and their, their messages and the impact that they're trying to have to expand that. Um, it just, it's feel good. Yeah. Honestly, it feels good to me. Um, you know, as, as much as I'd love the biggest paycheck in the world for, <laughs> for doing something that's, you know, the, that might, you know, might violate some of my values and morals. I, it's just not going to happen. You know, I'm here to, to, to have a positive impact. And if we can help these folks that are doing good things by getting the word out and expanding their footprint, then, you know, that's, that's what I'll rest my laurels on. And, uh, really cool to hear about some of these, these clients you've worked with and helped. Yeah. When you, so like, I'll kind of push this, the question back at you too. I'd love to hear about how are organizations you're working with using their podcasts? Are they using it as an awareness piece? Are they using it? I know you mentioned the one, like the history kind of piece and getting that out there, but what are some examples of how organizations are using their podcasts? Late last year, late 2023, we worked with an organization that was really trying to reach uh, a very specific goal, trying to reach uh, women in the South uh, white women in the South who uh, ha are religious and to and undecided voters. Mm -hmm. So our goal was to um, reach them with uh, a faith a faith based message um, that is uh, centered on uh, social justice, on um, race, uh, and trying to communicate you know stories about you know civil rights and, and, you know, the, the progress that's been made there, but really using the church and the faith, um, the faith based content to show like, am I, my brother's keeper, despite what they look mm -hmm. like and where they come from. Um, it was a really unique and very, like I said, specific target. Right. Um, but it felt like, especially leading into an election year that, if we can convince people that, um, you know, because unfortunately, uh, and not asking you to comment on any controversial topics here, but just specific to like the church, how it's often we've seen recently been used to kind of separate people, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, like I told you, I have two uh, parents that are pastors and I wasn't raised that way, you know. Um, and so the goal is really to unify people and to see um people, no matter what they look like or where they come from as, you know, family. Um, and then how does that now extend to the impact that can be had in, in an election year that way, that how do people vote that, that reflects that? Um, so yeah, so that was an interesting challenge, Absolutely. Um, but, uh, really rewarding, um, to be able to create a show that had a, a big following and, and to really, use our the marketing aspect of of the engagement we had because it wasn't just making a great podcast it was also like how do we market to folks that uh, with this pinpoint focus mm -hmm. so that was a unique challenge and and uh you know a lot of fun um the show is called purpose that prevails and and uh and it was it was definitely a unique and 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 fun challenge but beyond that uh our biggest project which um really changed our organization, probably forexed it. I mean, in terms of the size and the team and the budgets and everything, was working with an organization called Play on Shakespeare as our, our partner and sister organization with our scripted fiction business. We make Shakespeare plays that are more modernized with a majority minority cast and, um, and playwrights and directors. So, cool. um, so, you know, coming from, you know, a white guy 400 years ago in England, uh, Shakespeare told some amazing stories, but how accessible is it? That's something we really wanted to do is democratize this amazing storytelling. Um, and we've done now 13 plays, Romeo and Juliet just wrapped up. We're, we're getting into Taming of the Shrew um, to kick off season four. That's it's cool. amazing to me, year four of doing this. Yeah. Um, and... And I really kudos to my business partner, Michael Goodfriend, who's been an actor for multiple decades, done a lot of Shakespeare, and it was his idea. And I'm, I'm just so 
uh, proud and really just pointing the finger at him in terms of like who's responsible <laughs> for all this amazing content. I mean, it's it's Michael Goodfriend and um, and and we're so grateful to play on Shakespeare and the Hits Foundation to to fund it. Um, but a key moment, I will say, that we're leading towards back to this election year is Julius Caesar. We're going to do in, I want to say August, September, maybe October, leading into the election of uh, that story, you know, et tu brute. I mean, it's so, you know, it, at least from what I studied in school, like it's it's stuck in my mind for this amazing story. But I never thought about how that would apply to today's events right. of power and in politics so so we try to time it right and now we're looking for like big time actors if we can get them um to to play the parts um but it's uh you know it's it's just so grateful to the fact that we we can even do something like this and, and maybe have an impact with it too at the same breath yeah what a fun like creative endeavor and i'm even thinking like so i love the idea of some things like for this is probably not quite the right way, but like kind of for posterity's sake, right? Like there's this, like you're capturing these Shakespeare, Shakespeare's stories in a way that can really be lasting, like legacy building. I'm kind of searching for the right word here, right? But um, no, I think that's really awesome. And what a fun way to spark an idea. Like <laughs> just thinking like the entrepreneur in me is like, yeah, some of the best ideas come from a friend, a conversation, a barbecue, a offhand, you know, conversation, <laughs> or comment, et cetera. Like I was just thinking about getting a little off topic, but that stuff really excites me when people are like, oh, I'm thinking about starting a thing. And, you know, nonprofits start the same way often where it's like this conversation. What if yeah. we could do this? What if we could change that? What if we could eradicate um this, you know, this thing. So I just really love where like concepts and ideas come from. So that's so cool. And yeah, year four, congrats yeah. on that. That's really starting to get some Unbelievable. like, I mean, I feel like year four, you start to really get in a groove, right? Do you feel like you're in a groove? Maybe I'm speaking for you. I just feel like that's around where you start to go. <laughs> okay. Like we're, we kind of know what we're doing a little bit most of the time. I do feel like we're in a groove and I would, I would add to that, that, um, Back to what we were talking about earlier on as far as like how an organization evolves and always looking for the next thing. Um, you know, when when I looked down and, and saw that the majority of our revenue comes from nonprofits, I thought, well, this is all based on relationships currently. Mm -hmm. It's mostly who you know or maybe one step removed, someone will recommend us. Like that's how we got the gig with the Levine Museum of the New South in Charlotte, North Carolina is because the interim CEO was the former, I think, president or something like that of the Chicago History Museum. And we had done a full pitch with them. Mm -hmm. And then they had kind of a turnover. And so we ended up not working with them. But the CEO went to this other museum right. and, and they were like, hey, let's revive this podcast idea because I always loved it. <laughs> um, and so, you know, who knew? You, you never know. And, and I'm sure anyone listening to this you know, you can put feelers out, you can put a proposal out in your business, and then who knows how long it takes for, for something good to come from that and, and, and that relationship that you built and, and showed, you know, your passion and credibility, you know, it, it could materialize in other ways down the road, you know, so, yes. um, so I think it's important to stay in touch for sure. And then also, you know, just always do your best, you know, in terms of like sharing you know, what, what you believe in. And then, you know, the people that resonate with that, they'll find you, you may be down the road with a different organization. But all that is to say is that we, we put a lot more effort now into to nonprofits because it has been uh, successful for us. And I, and I believe successful for the nonprofits we've been working with, because um, whether they have a lot of cooks in the kitchen or whatever it is, I mean, a lot of what we're talking about is messaging today and mm -hmm. storytelling. Um, that's the focus of this show. But uh but people need help with that. And I found I even needed help with that. So I'm not here saying I have all the answers, but I, I am saying that it's really valuable to go through this process. Yeah. And I'll just co-sign that. Like we are very much guilty of like the plumber who has, who does not have good plumbing where 
we also, we pull people in, right, to help us. We ask questions too. We validate where our story is and we get off track with our story as, as a company who helps people <laughs> figure out their stories and how to, how to talk about them. Because again, I mean, I think it's just yeah. important to realize that it's just so easy to be too close and it's so easy to be able to bring people in a room and be able to see the the pieces come together. But when you're part of the pieces and you're trying to like do it yourself, we've often found like we, because we do a lot of brainstorming, um, we're really good at that. Like we're really good at facilitating conversations and we're good at drawing out ideas and we have lots of tools in our toolbox that we can pull out quickly. Even as conversations change, like we can, we switch, you know, we change what we're doing in a session but with ourselves, we're kind of terrible. Um, I can't tell you how many times mm -hmm. when Michaela and I will be sitting there, we're kind of whiteboarding something and, and we have to step outside and either say, what would we tell somebody else right now? Which has been a really helpful question to ask. Um, or mm -hmm. do we need to pull somebody in and not being too prideful, right? To say like, we need help. Like we need to pull in somebody who does what we do to help us figure out, you know, these things. So that I think is just important to remember, like staying humble and staying curious. That's one of our core values is to stay curious. Mm -hmm. And by asking questions, you know, we can figure things out together with other people. Most of the time, sometimes too, like you just got to sleep on it a little bit, come back to it, like full circle and give yourself yep. a little grace um, with that too. But that I think is really important to remember. Like you don't have to be the expert of everything and you can pull other experts in. And I mean, the same with the podcasting. Yeah. Like I think there's a lot out there. There's so many great tools out there. Like, can you produce a podcast on your own? Yes, absolutely. You can, you can do that. Um, are there great tools, technologies? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But there is still value in pulling in people and a team and, and, and a company like yours, you know, where they can come to you and say, we're trying to hash through these ideas, help guide us, you like utilize the wisdom of those experts as well, which I am curious, like just thinking about yeah. that technology piece, like, are you finding technology pieces that you're using? Are there digital platforms that are like playing in for these nonprofits, whether it's, are you noticing from a podcasting standpoint or maybe just other things too, like how's technology and digital platforms playing in for your clients right now? I think given the numbers that keep climbing for podcast consumption, you know, the, the number I'm always looking at is um, percentage of the U.S. population that has listened to a podcast in the last month. Okay. Um, so that goes up every year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the pandemic had a little ripple effect uh, where it was a big burst and maybe slowed down, but still uh, it continues to increase. Um, so specific to the, the types of technology – some podcast listeners, a lot of them are, are getting more savvy. So they're using specific apps. Mm -hmm. um, so when we go through the marketing piece of, um, you know, complimentary to making a great podcast is getting the word out because you can make the best podcast in the world and, and don't focus any dollars or divert any energy towards the marketing piece and, and just use your ex pre existing channels. Well, you might find that not that many people show up. Um, right. So, uh, we have developed through a lot of failure <laughs> over the course of the last uh, two and a half years, uh, a bunch of marketing strategies and tactics to be able to um, to reach people where they are, um, you know, and while, you know, uh, some of the nonprofits we talk to have a huge marketing department or maybe not huge, but they have a marketing team, do they have experience specific to podcasting? Do they have experience specific to the medium to to be able to reach folks and, and retain them? Because mm -hmm. there's also a lot of services out there that on the marketing front specific to podcasts that can get your numbers up. But then the day you stop paying them, you're back down to zero or one or two downloads a day. Right. And we've learned, you know, out of the 15, 20 things we've tried, only a handful of uh, tactics actually work mm -hmm. with creating subscribers, creating that affinity, the loyal followers that want that next episode um, versus kind of pay to play. And then you, you don't really see that retention. This has been so wonderful. I know we've gone over time 
and we probably didn't cover uh, most of the questions <laughs> that uh, Nick prepared, but I, uh, I, I have just had such a good time getting to know you better, getting to know Tandem better. Um, it's really been a pleasure for me, and, and I'd love to do this again sometime if you'd be open to it. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Like, such a great conversation. I, I think there's so much here for people to gain, whether you're in the nonprofit, for profit, thinking about starting something. Like, we covered a lot of just really great things. And thank you, too. I feel like you've spoken to me as well, just some great encouragement and some ideas. And so I just really appreciate that, too. So thank you. Thank you very much for doing this. It's fun to do a little crossover crossover episode. Thank you for listening to this episode of Your Next Chapter. Leave us a five-star review hosted by JT, executive produced by Nick Kastner and edited by Justin Cortez. We drop an episode every other week, so follow the feed and stay tuned for future episodes. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, thank you.